Welcome back to Every Possible Angle. I'm your host, Michael Tajima, and throughout our series, we'll explore the multifaceted landscape of organ transplantation. In today's episode, we're excited to be joined in the studio by Dr. Joseph Scalia, Vice Chair and Professor of Surgery and Director of Kidney Transplant at the Medical University of South Carolina. We'll be diving into the dynamics of innovation in healthcare, novel technologies in transplant, and the convergence of technology and medicine. Welcome to another episode of Every Possible Angle. We're excited today to, to have in, into our studios here at our headquarters, Dr. Joe Scalia, uh, Professor of Surgery, Vice Chair of Innovation, and Executive Medical Director of MUSC Health Solutions. Welcome. You got it. Nice. Yeah, right nice. there. That's it's, a lot. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, right? Excited to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Really appreciate you coming up. And, and you've done so much uh, in your career and have brought so much uh, to the field of transplantation. Uh, we're really honored to have you here. And I actually would like to start there. How did you get into transplantation? What was your story to, to arrive here? Thank you again. I mean, it's it's humbling to be in a space like this, that it's committed to not only innovation, but transplantation, sort of two of my favorite things. Um, and um, thank you for the kind words. I feel <laughs> like I'm just uh, doing all I can to commit to the field and leave it a little bit better than I found it. Uh, transplantation is a special place. I found my way into it. Um, perhaps by happenstance, I was always into creative things and uh, art. I paint today, and uh, really, and I was sort of interested in engineering and art as an undergrad. And I was always taking things apart and building them, putting them back together again in different ways. And uh, you know, on graduating from college, I was sort of looking around at what to do. And medicine seemed like it had all sorts of opportunities to be both creative and scientific at the same time. Interesting. Um, and so, perhaps naturally, found my way there. And transplantation is sort of the ultimate opportunity to help people and put them back together in a way that makes more sense uh, and gives you huge opportunities to be creative. And so I think, uh, I think that's why it sort of fit my personality. Um, it's also really exciting, and I'm a super energetic guy. <laughs> so <laughs> it seemed like a, a really cool opportunity to mesh not only my personal interests, but sort of my ethos and uh, found my way into it that way. So I, I'm really curious about that because – you know, art and design and engineering, often, often you'll see uh, people going towards technology, uh, innovation design, architecture, that sort of thing. Uh, taking those skill sets to medicine, which I completely agree, there's so many unmet needs there uh, to, to bring that skill set forth. What drove you there about really medicine and then transplant? And then I, I know, obviously, from your title and, and, and your background, you, you, you're, you really... Uh, I think, dive into this technology side of things and, and how can we make healthcare better? No, I, think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I think creativity allows people to get excited, right? And I think uh, I'm probably not the best surgeon out there. I'm sure I'm not. Uh, I'm certainly not the smartest guy or the best engineer. Um, but I do get really excited about things when I think they make sense. And I think that's an opportunity for your creativity to shine. Um, transplantation is a, is a great place for that kind of personality, I think, uh, where I'm surrounded by a lot of similar folks, right? Yeah, that yeah. you have to think real big and think about putting people back together in a new way, solving yeah. great big problems uh, that sometimes seem uh, insurmountable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it takes a creative mindset in uh, in transplant to try mm -hmm. to make uh, or to make uh, big big leaps to try to really advance the field. And so I think in that way, it's it was again, relatively natural. You know, I think that diversity of backgrounds, bringing thoughts from different places, that's where innovation happens, you know, bringing a, a technical mindset, bringing a creative mindset, uh, a medical, clinical, all those together, practical, operational, that's where, you know, those different backgrounds, those different mindsets oftentimes drive some of the, the unique thinking because oftentimes when you're, you're in a space, I feel like you, you, you see a problem a certain way and, and when you bring someone in from, from different lenses, Help, helps drive sort of a new look to that same problem. No, I think that's right. Um, you know, not dissimilar from any business. If you look at the really successful transplant programs out there, I think of uh, the UCSFs and the University of Wisconsin's, go Badgers, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Michigan, MUSC for sure. You know, those programs are successful because they bring folks together by breaking down silos, and that includes different parts of medicine, but also engineering and folks that are totally disparate, right? Yeah. They just have different views of a space. Uh, we certainly saw that at University of Maryland when we were running our pancreas transplant program, mm -hmm. liver transplant program. Those were able to grow by breaking down a bunch of walls and barriers and building new programs in a thoughtful way. Um, and so 
diversity of ideas is critical for sure. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, like to see a lot of that in transplant. So, so with your your focus on solving problems in transplant, um, maybe let's start on the problem side. Uh, where do you see? I think I think we've come so far in this field already, but there's there's still so much to do. Where do you see the big challenges uh, in transplantation? Certainly, there's there's a lot going on right now with with new technologies, but also new policy changes, new infrastructure. Um, how do you see the the big challenges and the big big opportunities to to advance the field? Yeah, challenges and opportunities. Um, I mean, I think if I were to look at this from every possible angle, I think I would ask us to just take a I step back. I saw what you did there. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the name of the show. <laughs> um, you know, transplantation is incredible. The first transplant was 1954. 1954. It, that was true. R- right in this city. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Right. And we have gone from the first ever transplant without without even having tacrolimus or calcinurin inhibitors mm-hmm. um, to a, one single successful kidney transplant, right, to multiple Nobel Prizes that have affected the space and more than 40,000 organ transplants a year. I mean, that's pretty incredible. It, it truly is. And that's based on the underlying problem of organ failure. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's probably worth touching on that. There are 300 million Americans and 15% of people have kidney disease in some shape mm-hmm. or form, right? And so you're talking about 45 million people that actually have a problem that could be touched by transplant at some point. Mm-hmm. So the science that you're digging in on here mm-hmm. and elsewhere is absolutely critical. That's the problem, right? People that have uh, that require either organ replacement or supplementation or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. So this is a huge problem. And begotten from that huge problem are, are, are many additional sort of um, iterative problems that we're going about solving one by one, and there are lots of obviously very, very smart people doing this work. I think the biggest challenges right now are, just like I think about a technology, um, like you guys are doing here at Paragonics, I, I think we've got a great technology in the form of transplant, yeah. right? We yeah. can help a person by removing an organ from one person and putting it in another person. I mean, I do this every day, and it's still incredible every time you do it. Absolutely. An organ lights up, and it you know, it starts functioning on the table. I mean, it's mind blowing every single time. I think the medical students think I'm nuts because I get so (laughs) excited about it, but it's incredible, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that there, there are a whole bunch of caveats that come along with, with doing that. And I think about that, that as a technology now needs to scale, Mm -hmm. right? Let's get back to that 45 million people that probably need to be touched. Right. Let's call it, you know, even if 10% of that number need to, to be helped, there's millions of people out there, right? Yeah. And we're doing forty or 50,000 organ transplants a year. That's great, but there's an enormous need to grow, mm-hmm. right? And so we need to scale that technology. So I think the problem is, how do we scale what we have? And I think um, I've been very fortunate to interact with folks like yourself and others in the field that are really approaching different aspects of that scaling problem through either organ preservation or AI or tolerance uh, or even medication optimization. And so I think um, I think the underlying problem is scaling, and I think how we choose to go about solving that is really important, which sort of begets these individual solutions. One of the things that I'm, I'm particularly interested that you touched on there, I think uh, it's the technology side, but it's also people. Um, you know, the the transplant as a field is, is incredibly burdensome. It's often middle of the night, weekends, everything else. Um, that leads to it's, it's got a very high burnout rate um, how do how do we even scale beyond uh, and maybe technology helps this how do we scale um, the infrastructure to handle more patients uh, across these institutions uh, to make it uh, attractive both for for a career but also for a lifestyle to uh, be able to be a successful transplant surgeon as transplant program well staffed for for the longevity uh, it's a it's become my favorite question. I think it was unanswered for a long time because it was so daunting. Right. Um, you know, there was no solution, so you just do it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how we do it. <laughs> We've always we... done it that way. Um, so there are two problems in there. One is for the longest time, we didn't have enough access to organs and knowledge about who goes on the list right. to generate the uh, the the real need that you're now talking about mm-hmm. driving the demand and the sort of being mm-hmm. up all night. Right. 20, uh, transplantation has really become a, it truly is a 24 hour a day. 100%. Um, service, uh, be careful not to call that a business. Right. And 
it really sits, it, 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 it exists to serve people 24 hours a day. The key, though, is, is trying to make that, um, again, scalable in a way that the, the people that we have can do it safely. When we were doing 50 or 60 or 100 transplants a year per center, which wasn't that long ago, that was a nice, strong volume. That's a great service to people. That's not that daunting. Right. But what we know, as we've seen, and I see certainly in the MUSC health system, is people don't scale. Right. Right. So, so it's, you know, it's one thing to to be doing your your sort of a, a modest number of successful transplants. But now that we have we have knowledge around how to list people and how to identify better organs and understand more about the match, as that drives up volumes, we have a scaling problem of people. Right. We can't. They're just. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not unlimited human resources to do organs twenty four hours a day. I think the solution looks a lot like uh, an initiative that we've just launched at Medical University of South Carolina called SETI. Uh, no relationship to NASA's SETI program. Looking, <laughs> you're for not looking for extra aliens. Terrestrial <laughs> intelligence. Uh, this is the semi-elective transplant initiative. Um, MUSC is one of the biggest centers in the United States, and if you mathematically model the total number of organs coming into the system. You can all but predict when those kidneys will arrive, mm -hmm. um, starting with kidneys and then moving to other organs. I want right. to be clear about that part. Uh, and so we've sort of thought through what would this look like if organs were to come in and be maintained on advanced perfusion systems in the facility and then slotted into pre-existing time slots within the OR, sort of the reverse of how transplant goes today, right, right. which is a reactive model. Right, right now we get a an organ offer, we accept it, it comes in, and we sort of force the hospital to work around us. Absolutely. Now what we're saying is, let's have the hospital embrace us and say, we get it. You guys are busy, and we want to help more people mm -hmm. in South Carolina. And so in order to do that, we're, we all know the organs are coming. Let's make it easier for you to say yes. Right. Let's automate some of those processes by bringing in AI. Let's layer in critical technologies like pumping solutions and in order to improve quality and then get those transplants done at a time when we know they're most likely to have a successful outcome. Uh, and it turns out that not only does that, of course, help more people improve access, but it actually reduces costs too. And so that's a really exciting innovation that's really a systems optimization yeah. that we're working on at MUSC that layers in not only AI, but also organ perfusion systems, access to transplantation, and advanced surgical techniques like robotics. I, I think that's that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I actually, before paragonics, I've, I've been in a variety of spaces, in, uh, heavily in the cardiac space, but for a while I was also in radiation oncology. And, and AI has been commonplace there for almost a decade. Um, they're using it for treatment planning, for, for contouring, for, for, and, and it, it's, it's become a, a, you know, a tool. Um, and it's still, I think, uh, in some ways in its infancy in transplantation. And, and I think there's so, so many opportunities to apply AI in this space to, to exactly what you're talking about, make things not only better for patients, better for the systems, uh, but it's more cost effective too. I, I will say even on our side, we're taking a look at, uh, we have teams that we deploy all over the country and sort of similar idea, uh, systems operations, we're trying to find uh, ways that we can be predictive about where we should be pre-staging, whether it's people or materials or tools, so we can be more cost-effective and responsive to the to the system. No, I think it's I think it's critical. Um, I think your example of radiology is really interesting. So the real question is why hasn't Transplant adopted this, and where are the opportunities for AI and its implementation? Um, and even this conversation here is sort of highlighting some of them. You know, in radiation oncology or in radiology, there's a defined set of inputs. Right. Right. You're looking at a scan. What yeah. does the scan show me? Right. And the, and the computer can learn to figure that out. In transplant, the inputs are varied and they change for every case. Right. Which hospital, which donor, which recipient, what are the labs, where, where were the labs drawn? I mean, all of these things are disparate. Mm -hmm. And so you have sort what of. What are the logistics? Absolutely. between this point A and point Favorite B. Favorite topic of my own. <laughs> you know, the interoperability of those multiple systems has plagued us. Right. One of the beautiful things about AI is AI can be used to not only help you learn the algorithm, but actually find, find the algorithm within these complex systems. Mm -hmm. So help me understand what the best approach is in order to X. And in this case, the optimal, one, one great opportunity for AI is to help us do a better job of matching donors and recipients by understanding not only donor parameters and recipient parameters, but also the logistics of moving that organ from point mm -hmm. A to point B and how that organ is preserved in the in the interim. And I think this this initiative, it, it is 
uh, this this uh, incredible marriage of the the clinical science, the logistics, sort of systems op- optimization, uh, new technologies. Um, and, and I, I see this, this is a, a growing trend. Um, you know, I think we're seeing this uh, in, in uh, other fields with uh, of transplantation from kidney and, and liver and lung. We've heard it referred to sometimes as time shifting where they're, they're moving nighttime procedures to daytime. Um, and, and really uh, one of the uh, talks I was at at a meeting described this as uh, these changes in preservation that were originally intended for better outcomes as one of the the most important wellness initiatives in transplantation, right? <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 just fascinating to see um, the the way people are taking tools and applying them uh, to help move this field forward. Which well, is I, let's 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 uh, double click on that as they say that that is a, this is a great example advanced organ preservation of one plus one equals five. Right. Right. It, there's a there's an it, an immediate benefit of preservation because it's keeping the organ safe right. as you prepare to do a transplant, right? Uh, and we have some knowledge about it, right? Mm-hmm. There's even some numbers that we can wrap around that. Uh, the separate part is it may actually prolong the oper- you know, the time between, uh, you know, explant and implant. That's helpful. Um, but then, and then there's sort of this additional wellness component. Okay, that's exciting. But then I think what's coolest is that it may actually help us increase the number of transplants mm-hmm. and improve access with quality simultaneously. On the hospital side, the beautiful, the beautiful part about it is too. You know, we're not staffing an OR twenty four hours a day. Right. We don't need to. Right. Because right? we know when the transplants come happen. <laughs> We've converted it now to a semi elective process. So, so um, I think what we're seeing is all these very positive, perhaps initially unintended, off target side effects of a very cool technology. And I think. One of the things uh, I would also say that we, we're, we're facing is um, as we bring on these technologies is, is the, the need for collaboration across these uh, different sort of stakeholders in the space to uh, figure out the best way to apply them. And, and I, th- I think you particularly uh, have an have a entrepreneurial bend uh, and, and, and interest. Um, I'm curious, both both from your own experience, how did you get so far far that direction, and and what uh, advice would you give to other physicians who also want to take, you know, uh, beyond the incredible work of saving lives, want to take a a more holistic look at, hey, how can we change the system? Uh, no, that's great. I'm going to start with the second question first. <laughs> I would say this is a rally cry to every physician out there who understands unmet needs and has a possible solution. Take it and go. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's really cool to write a paper and share that with the scientific community. It's cooler to stand up on the stage at your scientific, you know, national conference and talk to your colleagues about that. It's maybe even cooler to get a federal grant that says we believe this this problem has merit. But you're still not really helping the patient. Mm-hmm beyond knowledge that it could be done. The next step is to materially implement the technologies and the innovations that we've thought about in the lab and translate them to to science and engineering that actually saves lives. Um, As an example, when we were in the lab at the University of Maryland struggling with, we're struggling with the logistics of getting organs and we were ramping up our pancreas transplant program. We had through many, many hours of staying up all night (laughs) before the wellness program that you're describing. become one of the busiest centers in the country for kidney and pancreas transplantation, um, sort of following the footsteps of the University of Wisconsin. And we ran into situations where we simply couldn't even get the organs. Right. And we sort of said, there's got to be a better way to do this. What if you could just move the organ from point A to point B, helipad to helipad with the easy button? Right. Getting back to this sort of underlying creativity, it's okay to be nuts. Uh, I was like, well, why don't we just put the organs on drones? Right. right? Because, right. I mean, the whole point of this is to, is to transfer the time from – from the transportation process to the hospital where we can have a more thoughtful operation, we can be safer, mm-hmm. have an opportunity to really work with the OR and schedule this in a way that makes sense, but that's not how the system's set up. So wouldn't it be easier if? Uh, and so at that time, I, I was like, Frank, you know, I'm pretty energetic. <laughs> I'm all excited. I called, the, I called the Department of Aerospace Engineering, cold called them, not knowing anybody. And this guy named, uh, this guy named Norm picks up the phone at 5 o'clock on Friday. And I was like, Norm. Uh, my name's Joe, uh, and I'm a surgeon. And I want to move <laughs> organs on drones. <laughs> and he's like, it was like a long pause. And he's like, that's a great idea. And I was like, really? 
I was like, I think it's kind of nuts. And it turned out he was the chairman of aerospace engineering. And he was just saying, because he's the only one there at five o'clock on a Friday, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that begot this very long project where we began untangling the logistics of organ shipment around the United States, asking ourselves, what is the best way to do this? Um, we then built out some of the initial protocols, uh, prototypes, and drones to facilitate that. We did our first testing in 2018, uh, and we transplanted the first person ever who with an organ moved by drone in 2019 in Baltimore after moving it from the organ bank directly to the hospital, air, you know, helipad to helipad. And uh, watching that happen, getting back to this commercialization question, um, is sort of how I got into it because it, it was a sort of bolt of lightning. I was like, right. oh my God, like, uh, like not only did we, did we solve a problem and ask questions about it and learn, but we helped someone. Um, and watching it sort of stop in the lab was not acceptable. It was not enough. You're like, no. Hey, you, you, can, you can just do a test, but that's that's not the same as, as bringing it into practice. It is bringing it to practice. And so um, that was uh, sort of the impetus for beginning this exploration into commercialization. I was very fortunate to then partner uh, with Scott Plank and some other good friends in Baltimore, uh, where I lived at the time. And uh, we built out, uh, you know, an MVP and, and built out a, a, a software platform that connects surgeons, hospitals, uh, and organ banks so that you can, like Uber, track your organ anywhere in the United States as it's moving from, from one place to another with the idea that by learning how these things are moving, we can actually use that information to, um, to enhance both shipment and allocation patterns and Absolutely. improve access to transplant over time. And so uh, that company, with uh, great fortune, uh, you know, ran up a, a great, uh, great big staff, helped lots of people, great, gained huge market share, uh, and is now run by Care DX, uh, yeah. which is a very exciting collaboration. Fantastic! That's so so exciting. Um, yeah, it's it's I, I I couldn't agree more. I've spent my my side on the, the development side, and uh, you know, um, the the path between a great idea and broadly being able to help a lot of people uh it, it's long and hard and there's a lot of lot of a lot of trips up there well let me i want to respond yeah we have just strung together all of our successes but we have not called out the thousands of failures along the way so <laughs> which is which is one of the most important parts is to absolutely to f- fail and learn from it absolutely yeah. Um, and and the other thing, going all the way back to the beginning of of identifying the need, your, your sort of call to arms to 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 your your fellow physicians. I think this is uh, this is something I'm passionate about. I, I used to have a, a professor also when I was at MIT um, that he would always say in product development, um, you know, we are you got to look for unmet needs. You're looking for uh, duct tape and bungee cords, right? That's somebody who's not saying they have a problem. They found a workaround. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I do feel like in medicine, all over the place, we have duct tape and bungee cords where nobody's complaining because we've gotten used to it. That's the way we've made the system operate. But if you step back from it for a second, say, that's a product waiting to be invented. That's a, that's a solution that could make the whole system better if we could just make that work at scale. I think that's a great analogy. I have the great fortune of teaching innovation, which, by the way, is really hard to teach. <laughs> uh, sometimes it means you just have to stop in the hallway with the medical students and say, look around, look <laughs> yeah. around. Uh, look for the, and I'm going to use your words now, look for the duct tape, look for the bungee cords. Right. They're so hard to see. Yeah. Right, because it's how we do what we do. You've it's, gotten used to it, and it's invisible now. It's the paper sign on the wall. It's the, it's the, it's the phone call that, in our case, we were making to a series of coordinators to try to understand where a kidney was before I needed to put it in, right? Yeah. And only to find that it was eight hours away when you thought it was one hour away. Yeah. That's right. But because it's part of what you do every day there, it's actually the hardest to see. Uh, but getting back to this comment about teaching innovation, there's a lot of really great work on this subject. Obviously, Clay- Clayton Christensen is sort of the, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. the, the godfather of this, uh, and I'm sort of a disciple of his learnings. I never got to meet him. Um, but there's a lot of discussion and a lot of ideas in, in what he's written around sort of identifying unmet needs as the primary focus of mm-hmm. innovation, right? Mm-hmm. Innovation in its, in I, the way I think of it in, in many ways is it's really the problem, right? 90% of it is the problem. Yeah. And if you really, really understand the problem, the solution generally begins to present itself. Mm-hmm. Now, innovation also has to be sustainable and better and or cheaper than sort of what existed before. And right. so the solution certainly has to fit that mold and you'd have to spend a lot of time thinking about how that both 
implements as a business model and scales. But um, there are so many unmet needs <laughs> in medicine. <laughs> I think it's daunting, and it's actually part of the reason that it's hard to see hard to see uh, the duct tape and the the bungee cords. But um, yeah, unmet needs are are sort of the primary underpinning of innovation. Mm -hmm. And the more we can do to learn what those those are and try to identify solutions and implement them is uh, is critical. And I think particularly in this space, it's it tends to be also a, a bit of an, like we were speaking before, a network and systems problem um, where um, when you're when you're solving a problem inside the walls of an OR, it's it's a it's almost like you said with with radiation ecology. It's a it's a discrete set of inputs, outputs, environment. Um, where we're talking about in transplantation, we're talking about networks of different organizations working together, different information systems and EHRs. We're talking about uh, transportation providers and and logistics providers across the country, uh, different technologies that offer different preservation benefits. You know, all of these all of these systems. Uh, uh, right now, there's so much duct tape and bungee cord holding them together, but also it's a challenge because there's a lot of interfaces here, right? They're not mm -hmm. all within one sort of jurisdiction uh, to, to fix fix the problem, which I, I think is one of the big challenges in transplantation. But also, excitingly, I think a big opportunity. Uh, there's there's a lot of effort. There's a lot of investment. There's a, there's a lot being looked at in this space right now. Yeah, no, I mean, like you can look at this and get scared and be <laughs> daunted, or you can just take it and run, which I know is what you guys are doing and what I think needs to be done. Um, I mean, I, I guess to rephrase some of that, but we don't have an operating system, right? There's no <laughs> singular underlying right. platform that helps all these things connect. And I don't know that it needs to be quite that pure, but um, it definitely makes it challenging when you're dealing with so many potential inputs. Again, a great potential use of AI, right? Mm -hmm. To, to mm -hmm. identify not only what is the algorithm, but what inputs do I even need, right? <laughs> right? right. And, and how can I get those and how can they inform how can they inform the solution? You know, I'm uh, getting back to some other technologies that I think are relevant uh, to your earlier question. I mean, I look at xenotransplantation, right. um, pioneering work being done, of course, by United Therapeutics, but at the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, my alma mater, a lot yep. of pride there to see <laughs> that work done by Dr. Griffith. Incredible to see, Incredible. Uh, to see that being done. Um, and as a, to some degree, correlate transplant tolerance, yep. uh, really pioneered David Sachs and mm -hmm. Megan Sykes now at, uh, or previously Harvard, now Columbia, uh, thinking about how do we adjust the immune system to accept those organs? Why? If we understand what the source of organs is and how to better manage them, right. access to them becomes a little less tricky. Mm -hmm. um, and those interfaces really begin to become more interoperable and a little bit more predictable, which will help us scale over time. And so thinking with the end in mind, you know, the future probably looks like, you know, xenotransplanted organs flying around on drones connected by this operating system that doesn't exist, right? Yep, yep. Uh, pieced together and quilted with the AI system that predicts which organ goes into who yeah. during the day. <laughs> during the day. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Um, no, I, I think I think that's that's it, it, one of the exciting pieces right now. I think there's there's so much possibility on the forefront and and there, there's an opportunity to to get in here and really really solve good problems um but it's it's also the the collaboration and that is why we we love having people like yourself come come up and, and be able to share your ideas well i appreciate it you know I, I think um there's a great big vision and future and bright future out there for transplant and um we're sort of half joking about parts of it but <laughs> i envision a future where no one needs to get sick before they get a transplant. Right. That right, access, right now our system is you have to get sicker yeah, it's in a, order it's, to get It's a little better. backwards. And as a surgeon, um, operating on sicker people is generally Art. not a great idea yeah. if you can avoid it. And that, that we, we many times have to do that in a reactive sense. But wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we yeah. nailed our understanding of predictive analytics and the biology and immunobiology um, and AI algorithms required for donor matching in in a way that we could understand that f of those 4 million people that we know are going to require some intervention. Yep. You know, when and in what by what method and how and what context. That's a really exciting future. It is totally possible mm -hmm. by combining a series of the technologies that we've been discussing here today uh, in, in order to not only save lives 
um, and, and reduce the cost of health care, but really make a, a, just a huge human impact day to day. And, and I, I guess I, I would, I don't want to close on, but mention, uh, you know, as a humanist, <laughs> You know, you can every transplant's fun, and it's super cool to show right. the medical students the organ light up after transplant yeah, yeah, and everything, yeah. and uh, that's what I say happens after it yeah, lights yeah. up after you reperfuse it, and it's 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 beautiful, it's cool every time. Um, but it's a technical exercise, right? And right. Uh, it's certainly very very challenging. We, we're very focused on it, um, but you know, I've done a lot of those, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've I've grown to have even a more of a, an appreciation for each of the humans that we touch every time we do a transplant. And so every time I do a transplant now, I sit down with the patient and their family beforehand, and I ask them why we're doing the transplant. Right. It's usually funny. They're like, aren't you the doctor? Like, Are you supposed to tell me you're that? Supposed to, you're supposed to know the answer to I'm this like, question. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Like the dialysis or the organ failure or whatever. I got that part, but why? And it's incredible. Folks pause, uh, and then uh, they, they think. And it's a kind of an emotional time. Right. And, and then they, they, they all know. They all have a reason. And it is never a promotion or money or anything. It's time with their family. It's God yep. and travel, right? It's yeah. just, I want to see the world, and I want to be around people that I love. And I want to be there for my, my daughter's wedding. I want to, right. you know. And so when, when we go to the OR, and I think about these technologies, and I think about that future, I know that being able to afford that to all those 4 million people, right. that is one hell of an impact. Absolutely. And that's the reason to be in transplant. I can't thank you enough for what you do, um, uh, you and all of your colleagues in this field, uh, to be hands-on impacting those lives. Uh, you know, it's it's something that drives the mission here. Um, uh, literally, our 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 whole motto, uh, "Every possible advantage," came from a patient who came up to to Lisa, our, our founder and CEO, and said, "This is it. You've got to give patients every possible advantage," and. Um, you know, it, it resonates with with the whole company here. But but at the end of the day, we're not the ones looking at those families in the eyes and 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 helping that patient through that uh, life changing moment. So so I want to say thank you for for you and, and everyone in the field who who's who's out there helping these patients. Oh, that's very kind. I um I'll just defer and say thanks to the donors. Without donor families, this True. wouldn't be possible. Uh, and without the technology to make these things happen, none of us would be here. So um, I, I try to remember the donors and those recipients and. If nothing else, it's a hell of a lot of fun to do this work yeah. uh, and, and change lives in this way. So thank you so much. Yeah.